Aquí estamos en Pensadores Contemporáneos. Es un gusto estar aquí con usted y este, tener el gran lujo y la gran oportunidad de dialogar con uno de los grandes, grandes sociólogos intelectuales del mundo actual. Este, Manuel Wallerstein lo, lo conoce. Welcome to, to the UNAM, Manuel. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's wonderful to have, to, to have you here in the, in the National Library. This is the Uh, the, the Mexico Room has a, uh, collections of some of the first printed texts in Mexico. That, and it's that, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm a great library fan in general. I like libraries very much. So I'm so, honored to be here. To the contrary, it's an honor to, be us, uh, to have, have you here. Um, Emmanuel Wallerstein is uh, uh, Doctor Honoris Causa uh, here in the UNAM. He received it in, in 1989. Um, he is presently professor researcher at Yale University, although um, most of his uh, professional career he spent it at uh, McGill University and at Binghamton University, where he founded and directed the Fernand Braudel Center for the Study of Economies, Historical Systems, and Civilizations. Um, uh, Emmanuel has also been the president of the Inter International um, Sociology Association. Uh, and in the early 90s, he chaired a very important commission called the Gulbenkian Commission on the Restructuring of the Social Sciences. He's perhaps well, most well known for this um, trilogy, which you know, continues to grow, uh, which is the El Moderno Sistema Mundial, which is the world systems theory. He is the father of world systems theory, which in a very fascinating way combines, well, you'll have to tell us your reading of it, but you know, Marxism, Weberism, um, Braudel, uh, it's an incredibly eclectic, innovative um, uh, social theory which has really transformed the way of thinking about um, global politics and society. Um, so without further ado, uh, Emmanuel, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, what is your uh, um, most important book, I would start with saying? What, what's the oh, my most important book, undoubtedly. Yeah. I think of it as the, the, the book that you just spoke about, mm -hmm. the, yes, the... The Modern World System. The mm -hmm. Modern World System, which is now four volumes. Uh, hopefully, in theory, there should be at least three more, but uh, given my years, it's doubtful that I'll be able to do three more. What I did do in the fourth volume is I wrote a long introduction Uh, which I outlined, so to speak, what would appear eventually in volume five, six, and even seven, but I'll never write five, six, or seven, I don't think. I mean, uh, it's just too elaborate, too much work, too, it takes too much time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm youthful, I know, but I'm not that <laughs> youthful. Well, Marx planned on writing, you know, how many volumes of Capital, and it was the... Yes, well, he... He, um, he didn't finish, did he? And, You're doing uh, better than him, though. You at least yeah, wrote four volumes. Yeah, right? there's, there's a sense in which uh, mo no serious thinkers ever finish their intended outline, uh, and uh, I'm no deviant from that fruit. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to finish, but uh, as it is, I'll have to leave it unfinished. But that's good, you know. Uh, it leaves it open. It leaves it open for successor uh, thinkers mm -hmm. to work with the ideas which I've put forward uh, and uh, may improve them in the light of what uh, takes place in the years following my demise. You were born in Brooklyn. In New York. No, no, I was not born in Brooklyn. I was physically born in Manhattan. Okay. But be because my father was. Uh, a doctor at a, at a hospital mm -hmm. in, in Manhattan, but I, we lived in the Bronx, not in Brooklyn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please, this is, <laughs> the, this is you know, uh, a, a sort of competition between of the boroughs. So we are Bronxites, we are not Brooklynites. And you lived in New York um, all of your childhood? Well, we, we lived in New York basically, uh, I lived in New York basically till I was 40 years of age. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that point, I moved to Montreal, then we moved to uh, California. As uh, a child, you, you moved to all yes, those places? Uh -huh. Yes, so uh, the first 40 years of my life were born, were, uh, my residence was Manhattan, mm -hmm. or was New York City. And uh, 
So I think of myself as a New Yorker. People should mm -hmm. think of me as a New Yorker, but I've now, so to speak, uh, moved on to other, uh -huh. other domains. Uh, and when did you discover that, you, that writing and research and academics was your, was your passion? Was it oh, somehow inevitable from the childhood that you were going to no, choose that no, path? No, no, actually, uh, I was interested in everything. I had this passionate, uh, this global interest of, in all kinds of things. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, I thought I, I might want to go into journalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I went to college. I went to college at, at Columbia College, which was a very, I think, a very wonderful place, a wonderful experience for me. And, I, and they had a very peculiar system at that time. They don't any longer. But at that time, uh, they, you couldn't major in anything. You could have a subject of major interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I simply took... Any, I would take five courses a semester, normally, and a anything I took two courses in, I declared as my subject of major interest. Uh -huh. So I went through four different subjects of major interest. The last one was sociology. Uh -huh. The last one. The last of the, f uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased that I chose that because I found it. The reason I chose sociology mm -hmm. was I felt. It was the least constraining hmm. of all the disciplines. It, it allowed you the most leeway to wander into other fields. Uh, and I think that was correct. I still believe that. And so I went into sociology. I became, uh, I went, did my graduate work in sociology. Mm -hmm. But uh, even then, uh, uh, you know, I, I was notorious for my interest in history and so forth, and uh, there it is. And I became technically a sociologist. I have all my degrees in sociology. I, have, I, I always had appointments in sociology. But if you ask me, what are you? I would say I'm a historical social scientist. Historical. History is your, is your, yes. is your passion. Yes. Now, in the United States, this kind of academic trajectory is not exactly going to land you the highest paid jobs, right? It's uh, often, well, you know, with this obsession on disciplinary boundaries of economics and political science, you know, social sciences are increasingly moving towards, the, you know, the hard science yes. Um, paradigm. Yes. Um, has well, that gotten I, worse? I, I was moving them away from it, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, how shall I say, did it, did it, uh, in terms of career, did it make it more difficult to get appointments and so mm -hmm. forth? I suppose so, but really the constraints always were those constraints which I put on mm -hmm. where I wanted to go and where right. I wanted to be. So, yes, I suppose I did not. I mean, if you, if you look at my income, annual <laughs> income, it was probably lower than a lot of other people, but uh, it, I didn't suffer uh, materially sure, from it. So. Of course, well, you're a, you're a, a special case, of course. But it's um, it seems to me that sometimes you know today, correct me if I'm wrong. In, for a young scholar in the United States, uh, the pressures are so hard. Um, well, the pressures get, all, all, getting, always were hard. The, the pressures are, always were hard. Um, you were expected to commit yourself to a certain list of topics and uh, certain limits of constraint. Mm -hmm. You were expected to publish in certain places. If you didn't publish in the right places, you didn't get promoted. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you thought uh, about where you would like to publish, you were constrained, forced into uh, the, uh, the uh, tight belt right. of the disciplines. So the disciplines served to constrain people from wandering and they were reasonably successful in that. They've always been, they are still today. But today, actually, in the last 10 years or so, uh, it's become more easy to be 
someone who engages in multiple mm -hmm. activities that are not all in certain publications and certain teaching loads and so forth. You feel like the social sciences are starting to open up in general in the world, or is that going too I far? I think the, uh, the social sciences are starting to open up with great resistance, and some social sciences uh, open up more than other social sciences. So, uh, But it's, it's, it's still a battle. It's a continuing battle uh, for the well, I don't know, forever, perhaps, <laughs> but in any case, for a long time to come. And in, in, is Europe, you also spend, um, well, recently, at least uh, since the turn of the 21st century, you spent half of your time in Paris and in France correct. specifically. And you, well, you served as, the, as research director for the, uh, I'll try my friends, École de Haute Etude de Sciences Sociales in Paris, right? Correct. Um, well, and do you feel more comfortable there in, in that academic yeah. environment? Is it different? Yeah. The French academic system is a very complicated one, but there was, is and was something called the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, of which Blaudel at one point was the uh, uh, coordinator, uh, and uh, I was able to have a sort of recurring appointment for be there six months of the year for a long, long time. I still have that link mm -hmm. to this day uh, with Paris. I just don't spend six months of the year in Paris anymore. But uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm the only living person who n served well all five directors of the Maison des Sciences uh -huh. de l'Homme. So I, I represent continuity <laughs> of a certain kind, which is important. And as a result, there's a structure which we've created called the Ami mm -hmm. de la Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, mm -hmm. which is an attempt to get people from around the world, including France, but not only France, uh, to uh, commit themselves to supporting the uh, Maison des Sciences de l'Homme and its historic mission. And I'm the president mm. des amis of the friends. La Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we have, to, we have to work with you then to, 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 to strengthen um, that institution. It's absolutely wonderful. The time I've spent in, in France is uh, this is my own personal experience. I feel like there is a little bit more openness to sociology, to interdisciplinary historical work in in French Academy. Um, I haven't been in the United States Academy for a long time, but um, I'm, opti I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by what you're saying in terms of the, what, what's changing in terms of uh, social sciences. What, are you optimistic in general about the world today? Do well, you think that we are moving forward or, or uh, this, what is your read? This is a question I always get after any little talk I'm asked, are you optimistic? Um, uh, I say, I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. It's 50-50 because inherently it's impossible to anticipate, to predict what will happen. That's part of the um, uh, Prigogine. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention Prigogine, right. but he's another of my mentors. Uh, Prigogine's uh, analysis of um, changing institutions, mm -hmm. and it's, it's inherently impossible to predict how things will turn out, but it's possible that they can turn out in any direction. It's open. So in that, I say that's 50-50, because it all depends on how be people behave during what I call <coughs> the structural crisis of the previous system, mm -hmm. which is something that goes on for 60, 70, 80 years. And finally, it, it leans in one direction more than in another direction, and you have a new mm -hmm. world system or multiple systems mm -hmm. uh, in operation. So uh, we are in the middle of that right now in, in the world in which we live, and I say, I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. 
it's, it's not a relevant category, so to speak. Well, I, I would say that that's... Everybody wants to be optimistic <laughs> about their point of view, and I can't stop them from being optimistic about it, but I don't think analytically it's a correct position. To me, what you're saying is an optimistic point of view, because what you're saying is that it depends on, yes, it on us. It depends it, on us, and that's, it, it that's wonderful. That's inspirational. It depends on us. Mm -hmm. it, it is what every single person does mm -hmm. every many second uh, in a mini act action in a mini location. Every such action is a meaningful action and enters into the totality of the pressures on the system in transition and whether it will tilt one way mm -hmm. or the other definitively. And it's on, mm -hmm. we don't know when that will happen, although we can estimate it in various ways, but we don't really know when it will definitively tend to, uh, tilt one direction or the other, but it will. It will because nothing is permanent, right? Everything is temporary. Um, you have a system that operates for the time that it operates, and it has rules and so forth, but it, the, what is not, every system has three moments of time. The moment of time when it comes into existence, mm -hmm. and it's nothing inevitable about it having come into existence. So you can analyze that. And then it operates, it's what I call its normal life. And then you have to figure out the rules by which this normal life persists. And then for various reasons, the normal life cannot go on any longer. You enter into the structural crisis. So we're in the structural crisis. That's the third phase, uh, the first, third temporal phase of a system, a world system. Uh, and when did this, f so the, it, these are 68 year, 80 year periods more or less? I mean, yes, I say that. Uh, but the present, system that we're in right now, we're in, we're in a moment of decay and crisis, you yes, say. Sir. This, when did it start? When do you, the 60s? Well, again, it's a uh -huh. matter of debate. Right. Uh, I, I more or less counted as starting with the World Revolution of 1968, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, I don't want to fight and argue about right. did it start 10 years earlier or 10 years later. I think the evidence is we're in the middle of it and uh, that's it, that's what we have to operate with. But this means that we're on the verge of, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps in 20 years, yes. of uh, a possible structural qualitative type of transformation, which might be for better or worse, or it, <laughs> up or it, down. It, exactly, uh -huh. it, might be, it might be much better, and it might be much worse mm -hmm. than what we have today. It's, it, uh, nothing is guaranteed. Of course. Nothing is guaranteed. But that means that what we do today is particularly important. Yeah. Perhaps more important than what we might have done 20 years ago because well, we are approaching this moment. You have right? more impact on the system now mm -hmm. than you, that is to say, when the system operates normally, there are fluctuations, of course, there are fluctuations in any system, but the system operates to, pr to push you back to equilibrium. So you put in a lot of effort to change <laughs> things and you end up changing it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're in the structural crisis, it's exactly the opposite. The system fluctuates wildly, mm -hmm. wildly, unpredictably, right? And, uh, but on the other hand, so in a sense, you, you don't know, you're so uncertain, you, you're, you're, you're confused. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, every action on your part mm -hmm. actually has a real impact mm -hmm. on the outcome. So in that sense, we are privileged to be part of the choice for the world of its future, a future that will go on for as long as it goes <laughs> on, because, you know, again, a systems Systems auto-destroy, mm -hmm. auto-destruct, and we're in the stage where they're auto-destroying. So the younger generation, our students, uh, I teach uh, first semester uh, undergraduates, mm -hmm. uh, law school, the law school is an undergraduate program here, here in Nyunam. They're 18, 17, 19 years old. 
they are you know, going to live a, a very intense, uh, particularly intense time during, uh, during and this generation. A particularly generation. confusing time. <laughs> confusing. A right? particularly confusing time in which they will do all sorts of things that they will, six months later or six years later, regret that they did mm -hmm. uh, because it's impossible to define what is the correct behavior, uh, but you have to try. So, yes, they, they will be finding it. How shall I say? I, I, I wrote a book in 1973, I think, called Historical Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I, I said that there's the, the three phases. And the second phase, which we're in, is hell on earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's hell on earth. Uh, and uh, we have to live in hell on earth. Would it be too much to say that hell on earth, we could replace that with Donald Trump and Jair <laughs> Bolsonaro? Uh, ah, or are we, they just we, mi micro symptoms of they're something They're micro else? symptoms. Mm -hmm. I think we shouldn't overestimate. Mm -hmm. These people can do great damage uh, and, and they have terrible values and so forth, but they're less powerful than they think precisely because we're in a structural crisis of the modern world system. And they can try hard, right? But they can't shift it significantly. They can only do it momentarily. Well, momentarily, we live momentarily mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that's worrisome. Uh, if, if as a result of what they're pushing, we go to a, uh, another major war, which people drop atomic weapons and so forth, that's not a minor thing. Mm -hmm. That's a very serious thing but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's transforming the world system. So in, in Mexico, in contrast to Brazil and the United States, there's lots of excitement. All of a sudden, there's this kind of feeling, like you're saying, that we're living this magical moment. All of a sudden, after so many years of, yes. of political stagnation, yes. things just burst through, right? On, yes. on July 1st, the guy, Lopez Obrador, who has been running and been kicked out and prevented from arriving to the presidency, all of a sudden blasted away the opposition. Yes. 30 million votes, 53% of the vote, took, carried Congress, uh, most of the states, yeah. um, broke through even class and racial divides. He used to be a candidate more of the South and um, uh, uh, you know, more indigenous working class areas. And he also this time won in the North, middle class, urban. Uh, so there's lots of excitement, but perhaps this is just kind of naive. Uh, um, uh, we don't does know. Does it make sense? Does we it make, don't know. It could, 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 could this could, political change in Mexico actually lead to well, more, it, bigger it things really in the world? It really depends on how mm -hmm. people behave once the new regime is in political power mm -hmm. and what they do. There are many choices. Uh, I mean, uh, the people who have the legal authority to do X they make decisions constantly, 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 and they are under enormous pressure from various interest groups who have directly opposite points of view and so mm -hmm. forth. So it's hard to know in advance what they will do and whether they will make the right choices or mm -hmm. not. But try. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> I encourage everybody to try as hard as they can to influence the powers that be in the direction that they think they ought to go. And to some extent, they will succeed. Uh, to other extents, they won't, right? I mean, what they shouldn't do is sit back and say, it is inevitable that. Mm -hmm. the, nothing is inevitable. Nothing is inevitable. The, I have to say that 55 <laughs> times. Nothing is inevitable mm -hmm. and nothing is sure. Uh, so we try, and the things are challenged back, and we have to fight and fight and fight. We have to fight the same battles time and time and time again, and we have to do it with the sense that we can influence mm -hmm. the future and believe that our interventions are meaningful. So, so this small disruption coming from Mexico, the global neoliberal consensus could theoretically create um, waves of, of positive it, it influences. It could, right. or it could 
peter out. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, those are alternative right. possibilities mm -hmm. that, you know, I can say as an analyst, but also as an activist, I have to say to people, pay no attention to that, work hard, try mm -hmm. to insist on the correct decisions being made by the correct people and so forth and so on. It's the logic of struggle, right? It's the logic of struggle. Struggle is eternal, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is the moment where the struggle is most important because the outcome of this struggle is the most consequential. Mm -hmm. So what was done 200 years ago might have been enormous changes momentarily and then pushed back. And now we have the opposite situation and we must profit from it. Left and right, do those concepts still For me, they make do. sense? I speak of the global left and the yes. global right, absolutely. I think that's the essence, the heart of the struggle. I think that what separates uh, one group from the other uh, is, is a position in the class struggle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but naturally, what is a class and how wide is it and how narrow is it and who defines it and so forth, that's a matter of debate. So behind this discussion of class struggle uh, lurk many other interests, which some of which have temporarily useful purposes and many of which have destructive purposes. And we have to, how should we say, work hard on clarity of judgment mm -hmm. of on, on our part of what's going on. So this, with this clarity of judgment, we then have to make a moral choice. I'm on this side and not on that side. And then we have to make a political choice, say, okay, if you're on that side or you're on my side, what is the politics that will get us furthest? These are, these are ongoing debates. They will not cease. What is the, I mean, it, it's, uh, I think I agree with you. You've, I've been struggling with this idea myself. I think a lot of people are. I think you're right. We need to defend and, and articulate uh, a new vision of the left. The problem is that so many of the past reference are discredited. For, yeah, of course they are. Of course but they perhaps are. incorrectly, perhaps incorrectly right. or, or no, unfairly. No. Well, but where they what, did the good that they did, mm -hmm. but that was limited. That's, that's, that's the way I would put it. They, well, they're not to be written off. Mm -hmm. They had some positive effects, but they, didn't ha they didn't, weren't able to transform the system. The system was too strong for them. Mm -hmm. And we were pushed back to an equilibrium point a little, a little further up mm -hmm. the scale, but not much. Where are the, the, the key sites for leftist action and thought that you can everywhere. identify today? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. There is no key site. That's the, po that's the point. There's no there, vanguard. Mm -hmm. No. We, we, we come to power in Mexico or in South Africa or in India or, or wherever or in China, right? People come to power. Movements come to power. And what, what do they do with it? They do what they do with it. And we have to analyze it and be careful. Be careful not to be too harsh about it, but be careful not to be too naive about it. And to see <clears throat> what is pushing them back uh, away from the forward movement that they were trying to make and, to, and which in, uh, justified their coming to power. They came to power with this pressure. I wrote a paper. I, I, I spoke to uh, 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 an annual meeting of the South African uh, Sociology Association several years <coughs> after uh, Mandela came to power. And, uh, and I said to them, look, you know, you've got to realize that there are counter pressures occurring here and there's nothing inevitable about your staying in power or staying 
are still representing the positions that you represented historically. And of course, in the case of South Africa, I'm afraid that's true. The, uh, you know, Mandela, but that doesn't mean that Mandela was wrong in making the, the deal, and he did make a deal with the, with the rulers of South Africa in order to get first democratic elections in his, ever in history in, in South Africa and, and to get uh, an important transformation of the country, but only a limited transformation. Mm -hmm. So we hope that it will be better in, in Mexico. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, you'll have to come back again and visit um, periodically so you can d give us your evaluation. Let's go back to your, your intellectual um, foundations. Prigogine, <laughs> Marx, mm -hmm. uh, Weber in a certain sense, but uh, uh, in a particular sense, uh, and uh, of course, Proudel, for all, all people who influenced me and from whom I drew lessons and tried to incorporate it in my mode of thinking. And uh, these are all, oh, and uh, don't, don't forget uh, Fanon. Oh, Franz Fanon. Now, these are all people uh, whom I know personally, uh, except those that were no longer alive, like Marx or, or Weber, I didn't know personally. But all these others are people I met, was able to talk with, and be influenced by and draw some lessons from them. So it was very important in my life that I was able to do this. Uh, it was in many ways lucky, but uh, anyway, I was able to do that and uh, to maintain that link until they died. Okay. So the, the most recent book from, of Prigogine was the, is the one that most um, well, I, moved you he, recently. You mm -hmm. know, he kept writing and rewriting and rewriting, mm -hmm. as all of us do. Uh -huh. And uh, this was a sort of summation, uh, an integration of his ideas, which I thought was the clearest, the best, and the most important. So, and that's already 20 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> I don't think I've had another book that it affected me as much as that book in recent years. And do you read novels as well, or, or just social science? What well, is your, what, what once your... upon a time, <laughs> I, once upon a time, I was a great novel reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's just so much time in life, <laughs> and just keeping up with a what's happening in the mm -hmm. real world and b what's being written. Uh, uh, in all sorts of fields has made me not read so many novels anymore. Uh, I regret that. I'm sure that it's, 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 it's not a good thing, but I don't know how to handle it. And how many languages do you speak? In well, or, under, or can I, you read? I, I say I order languages in the order in which I, so the, the language I speak best is English. <laughs> and I am always learning new words in English and new concepts in English. And my second language then is French. And my third language is Spanish. And my fourth language is Portuguese or Italian. I don't, I'm not sure. And then I have some German. Uh, and then I have what I call the hundred word languages in which I learn a hundred words. It's amazing what you can do with a hundred words in a language. So, for example, I once had, no longer have, but I once had a hundred words in Serbian, and I could communicate with people when I was in Serbian, mm -hmm. but with a hundred words. But then you lose those hundred words quite. So I have lots of hundred word languages, um, uh, but so what, so to speak. So again, I say English is my best, French I feel very comfortable in, Spanish is already a little more difficult for me, and the others become much, much, much more difficult. And have you traveled to Asia? To I've, traveled, I've traveled just about everywhere. I mean, I've, I'm now uh, 88, 
and I've had time to travel. Uh, I'm trying to remember places I haven't traveled to. There are a few important places I haven't traveled to, but there aren't very many. Uh, so, and I've traveled to a lot of them repeatedly. So Brazil, uh, Mexico is certainly one of them. I've been to Mexico many, many times now. Uh, as you said earlier on, I have an honorary degree. I actually have two honorary degrees mm -hmm. in Mexico. So the, that's my champion area for honorary <laughs> degrees. But, and so I've, I've visited all parts of, of, of Mexico, I think, um, almost all parts, uh, in, including Chiapas, in, including uh, Chiapas uh, under the Zapatistas mm -hmm. and so forth. So I think I've done pretty well, but I don't pretend to know Mexico very well. It's hard. You have to continually douse yourself, mm -hmm. in, thrust yourself into the water, so to speak, mm -hmm. to be able to catch up with where Mexico is at any given moment. So I'm here now, and I hope to douse myself a little bit and maybe come out of it knowing Mexico a little better. Yes, well, that, that we're very privileged to have you here, Manuel. Uh, talking about Asia, one part of the uh, sort of the, I guess I would say you know pop social science, right? People talk about uh, Asia becoming the new hegemon. Um, to what extent do you think this is actually responding to global political processes? I mean, well, is China really going to replace? The yeah. United States as the global hegemon in the short term. First of all, uh, we don't. We can't predict, of course. But no, 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 the no. tendencies. What do they say? It would require me to tell you how hegemonic cycles work. Mm -hmm. But please, uh, it is certainly true that that China has expanded its participation in the world system enormously in the last. 30, 50 years, and has uh, obtained considerable uh, advance in accumulating capital, right? And if the system were to continue normally, normally, which we are not doing, then I would say that in another 20, 30 years, uh, not China, but China, but East Asia mm -hmm. would be the hegemonic power. And actually, I would have predicted that the United States would not be its opponent, but its junior partner, mm -hmm. right? And its opponent would be Europe combined with Russia. Interesting. Okay, all of that is if it went on normally, but it's not gonna go on normally, <laughs> see? So this, but it doesn't mean people aren't trying aren't pushing the normal push, but they're reading, uh, they're being blocked in various ways by this other push. So uh, today we look at the uh, uh, very silly things like who, who has the best stock market? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we say, well, China's up today and China's down tomorrow. It's, it's not important. It's not, it really isn't important. What is really important is how many people are employed really in various parts of the world system. And what we're having uh, is a real tightening of employment, despite the good employment figures which are published regularly, because they leave out all the people who have been forced out of the mar of the employment market and will not come back in. Right. So, will China succeed us as the hegemon? No. But were we to be in a normal system? Yes, they not they, but East Asia would succeed, they would be in a long competition with, with Western Europe and, uh, and, and Russia uh, and would win out with the United States as its junior partner. So this is a very unorthodox view mm -hmm. and no, nobody believes me. So. <laughs> but, it, 
You're probably right. Well, you might be right. 50-50. I might be 50. right, exactly. <laughs> but in the end, economics is what drives these processes? I mean, is, is the, the, your theory of the world yeah, system, yes, in the, the end, yes, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yes. economics is what is predominant, or you know, politics, uh, that's culture? That's right. How so I say, look, the, the, the present world system is a capitalist world system, mm -hmm. and the capitalist world system is no longer functioning, not merely for the underdog, for whom it never functioned, mm -hmm. but for the the, the big owners of capital. And they are as opposed to the continuation of capitalism as a world system as the underground. Now that, again, seems ridiculous. How could they be? But they, they realize that this system is no longer operating in their favor hmm. and will only wreck them further. So they want to substitute for it another system which shares its worst features of, of capitalism, but isn't a capitalist system. Capitalism is not eternal. Capitalism did not exist from the beginning of time and will not go on forever. Uh, uh, capitalism is a particular kind of world system, and we have lived through it, and it's been an amazing kind. It's been a very impressive kind, but its day is done. That's a strong statement, Emmanuel. Yes, it's a very <laughs> strong statement. We, we are coming to the end of capitalism. Uh, as, which doesn't mean we're end of exploitation and domination, of course. That's right. Right, but, but as a system of organizing production yes. and social relations, yes. we're moving towards another one which might be even worse. worse. Right, right, right. More, right. more it exclusionary. Might, it might be hitting people over the head very quickly. <laughs> all the time mm -hmm. in order to get them to uh, do the, the things that the people who are running the system mm -hmm. want to get them to do. For example, anticipating uh, who shall continue to live and die within the system. All those things could be much worse than, than the present system. But, I mean, so what? Uh, it, it will be worse and it could be better. Mm -hmm. It could be better in a, it be a largely egalitarian, largely uh, uh, integrating uh, system, uh, the like of which has never existed in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. It's possible. You know, the wonderful thing about the uh, World Social Forum is its motto, another world is possible. And it's the possible. It's another world is indeed possible, mm -hmm. but it's not certain. And uh, uh, so we have to struggle for that other world which we want. Uh, and, it's, uh, and even people within the uh, World Social Forum are losing, uh, are, are, are being mm -hmm. dismayed mm -hmm. by the fact that they haven't succeeded in more than they wanted to succeed that they are, uh, uh, how shall I say, repeating the same themes constantly. And I say, no, that's, that's, that's wonderful what they're doing. What they're doing is, is trying to enable people who are the underdog, but in various facades, various phases, to speak to each other, to explain to each other, to learn from each other, and maybe to work together in some limited way uh, to transform the world so that another world will indeed be uh, achieved, the one that is possible but not certain. You keep on, see, you're right. You're both optimistic and pessimistic. For, some, for a moment there, I was, I was feeling that you were being apocaly apocalyptic <laughs> we'll get to the end, and then we have this message of, of, of hope. Now, if we're moving beyond capitalism, what does that mean concretely? You mean that you know, private property is going to undergo a profound transformation? I mean, because I, I, if things just get worse in terms of domination, exploitation, distribution of the right to live and die, um, isn't that just hypercapitalism? I mean, what, no, it's why, not why, why are you talking about something else after that? I usually answer this que that question in this way. I say. Imagine that in 
the late 16th century or the late 15th century, a, a group of feudal lords were in a single room talking with each other. And they kept saying to each other, uh, we're going down. It's a terrible <laughs> thing. We're losing our power. What are we supposed to do about it? Um, and they said, they come up with some solutions. Well, let's create this kind of institution mm -hmm. or that kind of institution. Would any of them have been able to say that in the year 2000, the institutions that exist in the year 2000 would have come into existence? And I say, it's impossible to imagine. You, you learn in the process of it mm -hmm. occurring. So they tried this and then they will try that, and then they will try that, and then we will have what we have today, uh, which is capitalism as it operates. Mm -hmm. uh, it really operates, truly operates. And they couldn't have predicted it, but they took the first steps in building it, and the rest of us for 400 years kept building and building new institutions that would keep the capitalist mm -hmm. system operating until they came to the structural crisis, and it no longer works. In, in Latin America, in, in, in general, not just Mexico, but Latin America as a, as a region, has a, a, a particularly important role to play well, uh, it has in, in this structural role crisis, or what's its, what's its role? Historically, mm -hmm. yes, because it was uh, the first system that linked itself to Europe uh, the, uh, in, in the beginnings of a kind of capitalist system in a particular pattern which was established in the late, somewhere between 1450 and 1650, right? And it consolidated itself as the new system, the normal system which operated and it still was important, Latin America's role within that normally operating system was important, more important than some other areas in the world. And you, you know, you can take any, any moment of the last 500 years and Latin America played some important role. You can't say that of every physical area in the world. So in that sense, Latin America is special, but special in a limited way. <laughs> Very good. We're, we're, we're starting to get to the end of our, our interview. Um, the people who are watching the show are going to be uh, um, members of the UNAM community and uh, broader community of Mexico in general. Um, what kind of, of, of message would you like to communicate to uh, the students of the UNAM, for instance? Um, we, have, we have 360,000 students in this public and free University. Well, I would hope that at least 359,999 of them would uh, spend some energy trying to figure out what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. right? That is the most important thing, to get a clear analytic framework. And then, as I said already, with the clear analytic framework, you have to make a moral choice. Mm -hmm. And once you've made it, and I don't assume that all your students will make the same moral choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Only some of them will make the same, the moral choice that I would make, right? And once you make that moral choice, you have to worry about the practical problem of political uh, decisions. What can, what can we do to advance our moral choice? And, but if you ask that last question first, you come up with, wrong answers. You've got to ask the first question is, what is going on in the world system? So I try, I've just been trying, but I try always to explain what I think is going on at this moment in the world system. So first it's um, global diagnostics, then personal moral choice, and then political Action. That's, the, that's right. That's the the Wallerstein is the yes. three step, three, three, uh, three, <laughs> three step three theory step to changing the world program uh -huh. to change our world. That's right. So, 
I'll see how much influence I have by coming back <laughs> 50 or 100 years from now and see how many people uh, operate it that way. I don't know. Talking about, we have a couple more minutes. In the 1990s, you, you wrote this, this, this uh, you chaired this study of the Gulbenkian Commission, which was saying an agenda for 50 years of social sciences, and we're now 25 years in. Has that agenda been fulfilled? And what are the, the strategic areas for well, research? You know, it's, it's very interesting. That book came out in, what is it, 1997 or 8. It's been translated into 35 languages. It's, there's a Braille version. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impressive. So, I mean, yeah. Lithuania translates this book into mm -hmm. Lithuanian. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but has it influenced people? Well, the place where it's influenced people the least, I would say, is English-speaking world. <laughs> uh, they, they don't cite it, they don't quote it, they don't teach it. Uh, uh, they don't press people to read it. So, uh, has it succeeded? Well, it succeeded in one sense, as I said. It's got this amazing history of translations, and it failed in another sense that not enough attention is really being mm -hmm. paid to the themes. <clears throat> now, we just had a conference in Berlin a month ago, uh, the people in, Ber in Germany said, look, this book was never, was translated into German and so forth, and what we, all, what we ought to do is hold a, have a conference in which we try to figure out how much impact the book has had mm -hmm. and what kind. And we're going to hold this conference in mm -hmm. English because we want it to be a, a world conference mm -hmm. of people with multi, many languages and the nearest thing to a lingua mm -hmm. franca, unfortunately, for the English-speaking world. But that's another thing. With the failure of Esperanto, so we, we have yes. to do English. But in any case, <laughs> and let me, Say, let me, let me start over. Yeah. They did hold such a conference. There was an interview with me and one other person, and we tried to evaluate how important these ideas have remained. We, they had contributions from people, all sorts of Germans, but all sorts of people from mm -hmm. around the world. And then they published it uh, immediately. So it's available now as an analysis of how much impact it's had. You can read it and uh, see what you think about uh, this. There, there are many different points of view expressed in it. Well, an uh, invitation to our, our um, uh, viewers to review the original study of the Gulbenkian Commission and to uh, which look Which is at this. in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. The review, the rev this, uh, um, the uh, Berlin document has the original, the original version. And the commentary on it. Uh -huh. And it, the rest is commentary mm -hmm. on it, introduction mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. it, commentary mm -hmm. on it. And this is about the, 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 the new agenda for social sciences. That's I, right. I think we are just starting, but just ending also, this very fascinating conversation. Emmanuel, thank you very much for being here with us at the, I'm, at I'm, the UNAM, at the National Library. Um, I hope you come back and visit us very soon. I'm, and I'm glad because it is never ending. <laughs> I want to underline that, never ending. Very good. So we will, we will expect to wait for you um, to come back soon. And um, thank you very much for being with us. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en otra edición de Pensadores Contemporáneos. Thank you.